Hi guys, this is the definite article for Grandy School. I've got a lecture for you today and it's actually one I'm quite excited to give because I've been working on this for quite some time. Um, it's a return to the introduction to poker theory series which I think is the best series I've done so far. Um, and if you haven't seen the first four parts, I would actually strongly recommend going back and watching them. Because, despite the fact that some of them were made over a year ago, um, everything in them is still pertinent due to the mathematical contents. Um, and the extent to which what I'm saying in these videos is provably true, rather than um, a lot of what I say in perhaps live play videos, is more adapted to a state of the games which may or may not exist both on other sites and in the future that's not to disparage my live play videos which naturally I'm quite pleased about too it's just that I think that these videos these lecture videos are the videos of mine which you should really be watching um, as a priority um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about something called the Indifference Principle today. This is an absolutely essential um, part of poker theory. Probably the single most important notion uh, in it. Well, not quite the single most important notion, because there's a lot of pretty easy stuff, um, which is more important, but also fairly intuitive. So, for instance, if we decide we... The notion that we should take the line which yields the most EV against our opponent's strategy. That's pretty obvious, but it, it's also probably the most important notion. But the indifference principle is, is something which is probably, I'd say, almost essential for beating small stakes on stars, at least, in 2015. And as games are only going to get harder, I think that as any micro stakes player on, on any size, it's probably going to be worth watching. Um, though I will add a caveat and say that if you are what if you are playing um, 2NL or 5NL, this is going to seem very difficult to you unless you have a background in either economics or mathematics. Okay, so without further ado, we will continue. Yep. Yeah, so I want to talk about what I want to achieve with this. Um, I, it says video on this slide, but it's actually more this series of videos I want to talk about because. Um, I've got two parts prepared. Uh, I'm going to be recording three to five parts overall. So the bottom parts of of this slide I haven't yet got around to, but um, I will do. I will do at some point. It actually takes quite a while to make these videos, so I can't say when. Um, so the first thing I want to do is move the introduction to poker theory series back in something of a more concrete direction, something which is more directly applicable um, to poker and to poker games than certainly the last video, um, which were well, the last uh, set of videos which was on um, which were on solution concepts, uh, how we how we solve. How, how we solve games, how we find how we find the equilibria using game theory in the abstracts rather than specifically related to poker. Um, and yeah, I, I should say this will still be relatively abstract in that it's not going to seem quite as quite so directly applicable as the first few parts. So those are on constructing opening ranges and three bet ranges. Um, this is still going to be significantly more abstract than this. And it won't we, we won't be discussing how to play specific hands in specific situations as those early videos did. But we will be talking about theory which is which can be applied somewhat more directly and you which you can look at poker situations immediately with rather than it simply being a ground for you to build on and develop notions of um of, of, of your own, of, on how to apply game theory to poker. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the indifference principle. Um, I haven't mentioned what that is yet, but that will be a stage at which we talk about that, talk about why it exists. Um, talk to some extent about how it, how it works, why it works, and we, and we have an ex a basic example there, which will be one you will hopefully recognise. 
Um, we'll get onto that in a moment. Um, secondly, we're going to talk about how we can apply the indifference principle. And this is already in the second video, actually. We're going to talk about how we can apply the indifference principle to, to derive several fundamental concepts in poker theory. So, um, there are a couple I've chosen. I've mentioned for quite a while, so I was going to do a video on, minim on minimum defense frequencies. And I've decided to incorporate that into this video on the indifference principle. Um, and I'm going to do that and a couple more at that stage. And at that stage, and at the end of the second video, I'm also going to give you guys some homework, which which I'm not I'm not going to ask for answers, answers in the thread because it's it's a sort of thing which you should be able to check your own working on. You should be able to. Um, work out if you've got it, if you've got it right yourself and and also um marking it so to speak would be um substantially more difficult than than the homework i might have given in in previous videos which is more checking whether you've got the single sentence or one word answer i'm looking for because it's more the methodology which is going to be interesting there um and finally, um, after we've done some more applications, etc., um, we're going to be talking about what the limitations of the indifference principle might be, um, and the and if you are familiar with game theory, you probably understand what I have written on the slide. But um, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into I'm not going to t basically read those out right now because. Um, a substantial discussion of the indifference principle um, is going to um, a, a substantial discussion of the limitations of the indifference principle rather is going to involve talking about what these notions of subgame perfect equ equilibria and bounded rationality are um, which I, I haven't been through in any great depth in um, previous videos I think I might have mentioned subgame perfect equilibria in one of the previous videos in this series and I think I think I've mentioned bounded rationality in one live play video but I can't for the life of me remember which one it was. Um but nonetheless those are quite important, although certainly the last three is more of a criticism or more of a limitation of the use of game theory. Uh, I say game theory that's too broad. It's more of a limitation on the use of Nash equilibria, let's say in poker generally. Okay, so that's quite a long introduction I'm aware, but I think it's necessary to talk about what we are going to be doing here, um, because this is going to get quite difficult quite quickly, so I would recommend having a pen and paper on you for that reason. Um, and it's going to be useful. This is there's going to be a loss of um, our algebra in this video, so I would strongly recommend pausing the video, working through the algebra yourself, making sure you see what's what's going on with the algebra because it's quite important um, for you to understand uh, the indifference principle that you understand the algebra I'm going to use. Um, and certainly, naturally, even if you understand immediately and intuitively, um, working through some examples, both on your own as well as having them told to you, is going to is going to help your understanding um, significantly, and I would also add that I would absolutely recommend thinking about what kind of limitation, uh, what kind of um, small modifications you can make to examples and notions I offer in these videos, and how that might change what the res what the results we reach are. Um, and that's going to be extremely helpful too, not uh, not only with understanding the indifference principle, but that's also the kind of critical approach I feel we should take to learning poker generally. So, the indifference principle. Um, I'm going to start by reminding you of the definition of a Nash equilibrium, and we have covered this in pretty great depth in previous videos, so I'm not going to um, talk about it uh, in great depth here, but just to remind you, the definition of a Nash equilibrium is where neither player can unilaterally deviate from their strategy to increase their expectation. And 
if you if that sounds like gobbledygook to you, go back and watch. I think it's the second part of the um, game theory series, and that should be pretty helpful uh, for you to understand that because it's not a particularly complex notion um, or particularly complex wording. Right. So if we then consider what that notion of a Nash equilibrium means if at uh if at that Nash equilibrium in a poker game a player is playing a particular hand with a mixed strategy. So I'm going to use the terminology pure strategy and mixed strategy quite often in this video. So I'm just going to go very quickly define them. A pure strategy is where you always take a particular action in a particular strategic situation. So that's um, same card, same pot size, same board, um, same everything pretty much. Um, and a mixed strategy is where you don't take a particular action 100%. So you take one action some percent and another action some percent. And of course this can be two, three, four actions. Because, and because a player, to play a mixed strategy at equilibrium, they, could, they can't unilaterally deviate by definition to increase their expectation. Given the fact that they're using a mixed strategy and so they're not choosing not to use a pure strategy, it means that all the actions within that mixed strategy must have precisely equal expectation at equilibrium. Because otherwise the player could unilaterally improve his expectation by taking one action 100% of the time or at least changing the frequencies but still that would that would mean that it would it would still be a mixed strategy and therefore the logic would still work. So just to reiterate this is essentially the fundamental notion of the indifference principle. If at equilibrium a player is playing a mixed strategy it must necessarily follow that all of the actions taken within that mixed strategy have precisely equal expectation. And write that down. That is the notion, the single notion we're talking about. So, why is this important? And this is actually a pretty detailed slide. Um, so you can probably just re read this, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. If we use a mixed strategy in a particular game in a particular situation, and I'm, think, I'm using game in a technical t in a technical way here. Game here means any posed situation in which in which we're just finding a Nash equilibrium for the situation in which which we have reached so we're not passing any judgments on whether um, what's happened already in the hand forms a part of an equilibrium we're just saying given that is the case what is the equilibrium for the game which remains for the new game which has different rules to poker because the people the players start with different ranges there's a board already um, and that means that we can use the fact that we must be indifferent between the two options. They must have precisely equal EV. To calculate our opponent's equilibrium strategy, or vice versa, if our opponent is used to mix strategies equilibrium, then we can use that to calculate our, our equilibrium strategy within reason. And this is because once we have, and, and once we do have one part of, of this equilibrium strategy, finding the equilibrium in a two-player game is simply a matter of finding a best response, which is relatively simple. Because if we if we can say conclusively that one strategy forms part of an equilibrium, then we can also assume we also know that in equilibrium that strategy isn't going to change, it's not going to deviate. So we don't have to consider um our range as a whole, we don't have to consider what what certain players do to our range, what or anything. We just have to work we just have to take each individual hand and take the line with it which yields the most expectation against that strategy, against the um, component, other component strategy of the equilibrium. And in fact, the software which you can enter certain parameters, um, so that will be 
uh, ranges stack size. Um, and one player strategy, and you can click a button and it will calculate the best response to that strategy for you. Um, the most famous of these softwares and the most commonly used being Carder and ZV, which I think is probably going to be very useful to use. It's a, it's actually a piece of software which I haven't learned yet, but it's one which I get the feeling that I certainly should learn, and indeed I think everyone who aspires to be an excellent poker player should learn to use. Okay, so that's a pretty short introduction, admittedly, but um, it covers the basic points of the indifference principle. But of course, that's not it. There's well, that that is the indifference principle, but there's a whole ton of application that we're going to go through um, in later videos. Um, in in this video, we're just going to work through an example, actually, in a reasonable amount of depth. Um, just to make sure you have you you know what's going on, you know how and what you should be doing in a sufficiently great amount amount of depth that you can apply it um, to your game and 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 practically so, rather than just notionally so, as you might have been able to with, for instance, um, solving through domination in the previous videos. So we're going to talk about a toy game that I've talked about before in this series. You've seen it before um, if you've been watching the series. Player one and player two are heads upon, are heads upon the river, and stack sizes are pots. Player one's range consists of nuts, and so when I use the word nuts, I mean um, hands which always win. At showdown, they they're ahead of 100 percent of the of the opponent's range, and air, and when I say air, I mean hands which are all which are behind 100 percent of the opponent's range. They always lose at showdown with an x nut to y air ratio, where x is less than or equal to y. Player two's range consists of bluff catches. And and I should note it's not a necessary condition of this game that X is less than less than or equal to Y. It's just that with some particular situations where X gets too big relative to Y, um, the game sort of breaks and we don't work out ratios at all really because it just results in a situation where player one should be betting everything or jamming everything um, for a whole huge number of ratios. Player two's range consists of bluff catches and solely bluff catches. And you'll notice that I've um, noticed a point of interest there, uh, which I think is actually hopefully fairly intuitive. And as a point of interest, I ask why does position not matter? So, because I think this is something I'd like to explain in the video, I'm going to. Um, stop speaking for six, seven seconds in a in a couple of seconds, um, just to give you a chance to pause the video to think about it to come up with an answer before starting the video again. So off you go. Okay. So hopefully you've got your answer now. The reason why position doesn't matter here is because there is absolutely whatever position the two players are in, there is absolutely no reason that players who should be doing any bluff, any betting whatsoever. And this comes down to the very simple reasons for betting. You either, in in river spots, really, um, you, either, you either bet for value or as, or as a bluff, and there are some very limited exceptions when your opponent is playing an exploitable strategy. Um, but... Certainly, certainly at equilibrium on rivers, you'll find players either betting for value, so they expect to be ahead of their opponent's calling range, or as a bluff, so they expect to, they expect to be behind their opponent. Well, not necessarily behind their opponent's check range. That's not strictly true, but in general, they expect to be behind their opponent's range, um, and they expect to be able to win the pot often enough for it to be more pro profitable to bet than check. And when you have a bluff catcher against against the polarized range, there's just no point in betting because, well, you don't achieve anything. You, you're, not, you're neither betting for value or as a bluff. 
Okay. And and so player two won't be doing any betting. Either way, so so even if player one has check called a turn, if somehow you get into a situation where you do have this, um, and we're going to call this perfect polarization, it's, it's what it is. And if I as when I refer to this game later in the series, I will refer to it as a perfect polarization game or a situation of perfect polarization. Yeah. Um, so there's just no reason for player one will just donk after check calling the turn if this situation situation was reached. Okay, so so we have just talked about why player one should bet, and let's say that his bet size is n, and the constraint is obviously that n is greater than zero. If you bet zero, you, that's a check. If you bet less than where well, you can't bet less than zero, you're taking money out of the pot. So obviously, if if players who always cause exploitatively. And, well, just correctly, player one should never bluff because he's just giving money to player two with his bluffs when he, ha when he has a bluff if he does that. And we're assuming that player two um, has a fixed strategy because the player two will have a fixed strategy equilibrium. So the EV of the game for player two in this situation is X, and X is the, is an, is the number of value hands and the value to bluff ratio over x plus y which is the total which is the total of the ratio multiplied by minus n which is the size of the bet which is how much he loses when when he calls wrongly plus y which is the number of bluffs in players range uh, in in the players range but which are never being best in a situation, so he just wins when when player one has a bluff. Over x plus y, which again, as we said earlier, is the total number of hands, the total uh, all the components of the ratio, multiplied by the pots, which is what he wins when player one has a bluff. And and that's the same as as y pots minus x n over x plus y. And I think it's probably going to be useful for you guys to make sure that you can rearrange that um, rearrange that equation just just because we're going to go into some more difficult algebra in a second. So, given the constraints that are in the last in the last slide, this has a minimum EV for player two of zero, depending on the values of x, y, and pots. So, uh, player two can't have an EV of less than zero because he's never making a minus EV play. And and folding has an EV of zero, so he's just he's just never making a minus EV play in this situation. Practically speaking, this is also true given the constraints set out in the last slide. On the other hand, if players who is always folding, then player one's best response is to always bluff. And clearly, because players who is always folding, and against player one's bet, which happens 100% of the time, the EV of the game for player two is the same as the EV of folding, which is zero. Moving on, let's let's consider whether a mixed strategy is best than either of those two options. If player two happens to call ninety percent of the time, bluffing is minus EV for, for player one unless n is, is less than or equal to one ninth of the pot, the n being the bet size, remember. Against this strategy, clearly betting pot with value and giving up bluffs is going to be more profitable for, for player one than betting a one ninth pot range. And we're just going to note that we're not going to consider a strategy of betting, of altering best bet size based on hand strength, because frankly, um, it it should be pretty obvious that we're trying to um, form an equilibrium. And remember, the player two is actually going to be able to unilaterally deviate against that strategy to just win it on the money. Um, since bluffs are a zero EV um, in a balanced range, and he loses a lot of value with this strategy. However, the EV for player two of this strategy pair, which is player two um, folding ninety percent of the time. And which is player two? Oh crikey! Where player two is 
I apologise. We're a player who is calling 90% of the time. Apologies. The EV of the, of the strategy pair is 0.9 times the number of value hands over the total number of hands. Um, player 1 has that is multiplied by minus n, which is the bet size, um, plus the total number of bluffs over the total number of uh, components of the ratio, the total number of hands, multiplied by the pot, which is what player 2 wins when player 1 has a bluff, which is the same as, I mean, I'm just going to read that out, y pot minus 0.9xn over x plus y. And this is a key point. Given x and y are both necessarily positive numbers, given the constraints we've set out, well, not even given the constraints you set out, you can't have a negative value to bluff ratio. That's strictly greater than the EV of, of the strategy pair of always calling. And that's because um, you're subtracting 0.9xn rather than, 0, rather than xn, um, rather than uh, over the over the over the x plus y, which makes it necessarily greater given x is a positive number. Okay. So given this given that the EV of the strategy pair of always calling was weakly greater than the EV of never calling, weakly greater of course, um, just to remind you, meaning that it's at least as great as and can be greater as the EV of never calling. The EV of always calling being zero, and the EV of always calling being um, no less than zero. Remember, it follows that the EV of the strategy pair, which is strictly greater than the, which has an EV which is strictly greater than the strategy pair of always calling, is strictly greater than both pure strategies of player two. It, it follows therefore that player two should use a mixed strategy, and therefore the EV of calling is, is equal to the EV of folding at equilibrium. And I'm just going to go into a bit more of depth, more depth on that point because it's, it's quite important and you might not quite see what's going on. Um, so what is, so what our methodology here has been to calculate the EV in algebraic terms of both the pure strategies available. So that's always calling and always folding. Then we've taken a single mixed strategy and with the, the inequality um, on the third line down here, this inequality, um, we've shown that the EV of that mixed strategy is greater than the um, than both the expected values of the of either the pure strategies. Now, what we're doing at the bottom here is we're applying the indifference principle that we've just introduced. We're applying the principle which said, remember that if a, if at equilibrium a player uses a mixed strategy, which we have shown because um, because we've looked at the best responses of, of player two um, in in response to the, of uh, player one in response to either of these pure strategies, it follows that, that the EV of calling is equal to the EV of folding at equilibrium because the two EVs, EVs must be equal for, for them to be using a mixed strategy. Because otherwise, player two would be able to unilaterally deviate to either always calling or always folding. Okay. Just finishing off this example. We know one part of this equation. We know that the EV of folding is always zero. So therefore, at equilibrium, the EV of calling for player two is, is zero. But um, they're they're both equal. So the way we now solve the game is by giving giving player one a, strat a strategy, which a is is the best, which a sets the EV of sets the EV for player two of calling to zero, which as I'm sure you'll know is what a balanced strategy does uh, does to bluff catchers. But also, it has to be a best response. Um, so, what we find from that is that player one maximizes his EV by maximizing the size of his betting range, because the EV of the EV for player two is only zero when player one bets. 
against um, we're, we're playing on Betsy's equilibrium without allowing players to profitably deviate, so that's a condition which indicates it must be at equilibrium. And it follows from that that player one wants to bet as much as is possible, assuming he assuming he has sufficient bluffs to do so. If he doesn't have sufficient bluffs to do so, that gets it gets a little bit weird, and he can just bet his he can just bet his entire range. So there are actually multiple equilibria um, in that situation because um, if if player one um, if if player one uses a balance size, which is the value to bluff ratio, we, we we've learned about in, in previous videos, or we've talked about in previous videos at least, then he's still not betting all in. Um, and but if he uses a larger size, he can still bet his entire range for that size, but he doesn't have enough bluffs. So so the best response of player two becomes to always fold. And I, I guess that's not technically technically in equilibrium because at that point player one can unilaterally deviate by, well, well he can't actually no it is in equilibrium he can't unilaterally deviate because he can't bluff more. So there are multiple e um, equilibria in that situation which which is, there's no inconsistency in that. Um, we've talked about this in previous videos. Um, okay, so that's the end of this first video of the series i i appreciate this has been a little bit short um but hopefully it's going to be a video which you'll want to look through a couple of times it's been quite difficult and i'm afraid the next video is only going to get more difficult from here so um <laughs> this, there's no there's no relief on um in in this in this sub series um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope this has allowed you to start to think before probably next week's video, which will also be on, well, it'll be a continuation of this, if it might be the week after, um, because I do have a couple of other videos in the pipeline. Um, but yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's allowed you to start thinking about the indifference principle and the implications it might have for um, poker and equilibria in poker. Um, and best look at the tables. I've been a definite article for Grinder School. Cheers.